dear friends, dear clickers, uh, welcome to the lectures by Professor uh, John Van Benson uh, at the convention. At first, I make a short introduction about the speaker. Mm. This is the tonight speaker, Professor John Van Benson. Uh, he is contemporary, famous, eminent, powerful logician and philosophy. He received two master degrees of mathematics, mathematics and philosophy, and uh, uh, received a PhD of mathematics. Right now, he is university professor emeritus, University of Amsterdam. Henry Stewart, uh, Stewart, uh, professor, Stanford University. Uh, Jin Yue Lin, professor at Tsinghua University. And uh, co-director, uh, University of Amsterdam and Tsinghua a joint research center in logic. He is the founding director uh, Institute for Logic, Language, and uh, Computation, Amsterdam. First chair, that is first president and the honorary member, European Associate uh, Association for Logic language and information recipient dutch national spinoza award mm. he has been elected as the member royal dutch academy of arts and sciences academy uh, European uh, International Institute of Philosophy, a uh, uh, foreign member of American Academy of Arts and Science, Sciences, honorary member of International Academy of Philosophy of Science. That's Holland. 皇家文理科学院院士，呃，国际哲学院院士，美国文理科学院外籍院士，这个呢，国际科学哲学院院士，文学院士，嗯，呃，his main research interest, general logic, in particular, modern theory and modern logic. Correspondence theory, temporary logic, dynamic and epistemic logic, uh, fixed point logics. Applications of logic for philosophy, linguistics, computer science, uh, social sciences, cognitive science, <laughs> science uh, especially generalized uh, quantifiers, cat category grammar, process logics, information structure, update, game, social agency, epistemology, logical and methodology of science. Has publications so many, so not least here. Uh, uh, milestone, Li Chenbei's death, in his life. Lanti Lanti Lan, when in his 50th birthday, published a collection of essays. Uh, uh, 2000 Lan, uh, 
uh, when a year has 60 boss day, uh, the famous dealer, dealer of philosophic logic, published uh, a special issue to, 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 to celebrate uh, his 60th birthday. Uh, uh, 2014, farewell and the legacy events, uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh,在这一年呢,这个这个,分别是教授退休,所以呢,阿姆斯坦给他举办了一个云修仪式。呃,同一年,at uh, the same year, uh, uh, published the outstanding Confucius volume, uh, John von Benson on logic and information, uh, dynamics, uh, 2017, uh, the uh, publication and maybe many script uh, disposed in Holland, Guaja, uh, I can't announce the word, but I know what means. Uh, Holland, Guaja, uh, uh 2019, in his 17th birthday, uh, uh, both uh, uh, at Amsterdam and at Tsinghua uh, to organize organized workshops to celebrate uh, his 17th birthday mm. uh, in prayer impression my impression as i look professor john benson is very capable and powerful man uh, i hope sure uh very active and especially creative his brain is full of new idea uh I was very widely uh, from logic to philosophy, linguistic, computer science, social sciences, and cognitive science, and achieve important contributions in many fields, especially in logic. Very good at design of academic uh, project and organization of academic activities, always energetic, busy with pushing something forward, uh, always uh, busy with pushing something forward, very interesting and funny talk, uh, go that make joking, uh, moreover, he is very friendly person, whether to student or to colleagues. Uh, this is my short introduction about uh, Professor uh, von Benson. I also give a very short uh, introduction about uh, the, the uh, his interlocutor, uh, Professor Chen Rong, mm, my colleague, my young colleague. He, uh, 2012, he got uh, his PhD from National University of Singapore. Uh, then he stayed at Germany as a postdoc doc doctor. Uh, then he came to uh, Wuhan University, become an uh, associate professor, and then for professor, uh, his research field, modern logic, foundation of mathematics, proof theory, uh, philosophy of mathematics and logic. He received some honors, several medal of the 2014 Kurt 
Gutter Research Prize uh, Fellowship. Uh, and also, uh, Now, uh, welcome Professor from Benson gave his first lecture, uh, Interfacing Logic and Epistemology. He will give uh, two lectures, uh, the fourth tonight, the second uh, next Monday night. Okay? He talk more than one hour. Uh, and then Professor Chen Rong will give his short comments and questions at most 15 minutes. Uh, the audience, please write down your questions in chat room. The staff of Xue Xu Zhi uh, will forward your questions to us. Then Professor from Benson will give his short replies. Welcome, uh, Professor from Benson to talk. Okay, I close. Yes, yes. So, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I can see. Yeah, so. But um, lot, but a lot is so good. Uh, the okay. Partly, like the whole horse. And what about this? Uh, yes, yes. Just go. Mm. Okay, good. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chambo, for this generous introduction. Uh, you're much uh, too kind. Um, it's a pleasure <clears throat> speaking uh, at this uh, seminar that you've uh, uh, running at Wuhan. Of course, we go back a longer time since I already knew you at uh, uh, Peking University, and uh, we've had contacts uh, before you moved to Wuhan. But um, <clears throat> it's also a pleasure to actually speak at Wuhan University, if only because uh, Wuhan is the place where some of the earliest work that's relevant to logic and epistemology was done uh, by one of your colleagues who wrote about topological interpretations of uh, uh, intuitionistic and, and, and modal logics in the 1930s. Um, uh, to me, this was a recent discovery, but it makes me realize that Wuhan should be put on the map of the area of epistemic logic. Having said that, um, uh, so let me explain my topic for these two lectures. So I'd like to talk relatively lightly about some contacts or conversations between logic and epistemology. Um, this is a huge interface, uh, and I can only pick out a few uh, topics to discuss um, as things go with conversations, right? You discuss a few things, and maybe in the next conversation you discuss other things, and so on. So <clears throat> my topic for today revolves around knowledge, semantic information, and epistemic actions, and in some sense it's about a conversation between uh, the area called epistemic logic in its classical sense, which arose largely in the 1960s, and uh, philosophical responses and, and the sort of interactions uh, that there have been since between the two fields. Um, I'll do my best to explain things clearly. I will do my best to suppress formalism, and uh, but I can still imagine that you might have lots of questions, so you could ask these either uh, in the system that Professor Chambo has explained. So um, I'm getting a commentator. Uh, you may pose questions in the chat room. But if you uh, somehow have questions that don't make it in that way, you could also email me to johan at stanford.edu. And uh, as everybody who knows me can assure you, if you email to me, you will get an answer. So let me, uh, with this in the background, um, uh, uh, yeah, start uh, with my topic. Yeah. So I'll start my conversation or story uh, with the notion of information, because uh, to me, uh, knowledge typically has something to do with information. And ah, 
And before I do that, maybe one more word of explanation. So today's lecture is about some topics that connect the areas standardly called epistemic logic with issues in epistemology. But that's one way of thinking about the contact. In my next lecture on Monday, I will talk about another, perhaps a less usual way of the contact between logic and epistemology. Uh, on Monday, uh, the line I will choose is actually through epistemic views of the basic logical notions, like logical consequence and so on, just to have that in mind. So that will be a very different conversation, but also a significant contact. Having said that, back to my topic for today. So let me start with the notion of information, because uh, at least to me, uh, the notions in epistemology uh, that, uh, that are studied there, like knowledge and belief, uh, are grounded or have something deep to do with information. And if you think about the notion of information, you will quickly see that there's different views of what it actually is. And the notion that will be central to me today will be the notion of information as semantic range, which I will explain. This I've already said, but just to emphasize it again, don't expect a sort of textbook with every possible contact between logic and epistemology. Uh, you may have your own favorite uh, subjects at the interface of logic and epistemology, which I won't cover. It's not because I'm saying that they don't exist, but it's just I have limited time. So many notions of information. You can see this, for instance, in the handbook of the philosophy of information, which I added it uh, quite a while ago with Peter Adrians, my co-editor. So here's one notion of information, um, maybe the best known one to mathematicians is the one in the middle, the, the notion that underlies information theory in the style of Shannon. So that's about senders, receivers, and how much information you can actually send across a channel. And basically, that notion of uh, information has something to do with dependence between what you can observe at the um, at the end of some sort of informational connection uh, about uh, what's emitted at the source. So you could think of that as a sort of notion of information where a crucial aspect is dependence. That's also a very interesting notion to logicians, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Another notion of information, uh, <clears throat> which was also put forward around the same time, is that of Carnap and bar -Hillel, where you actually think of information as the range of options that you see for the real factual situation. So I don't know what tomorrow's weather is going to be like, but maybe I see a range of three options. It could be sunny, it could be raining, it could be snowing. Then that range of options is my semantic information about what tomorrow's weather will be like. Of course, only one of the three is going to be factual, but at this moment, uh, the, all the information that I have is those three options. Okay. Of course, that semantic information can get larger or smaller. So it's very large, then I don't know very much because I see lots of options. If it's very small, that range, then I know a lot. If, in fact, uh, the range that I have for tomorrow's, we tomorrow's weather is just that it's raining, then, in fact, I know the real factual situation. It's, uh, you know, it's that. It's going to be raining. In my talk, I will also briefly, that's the third point, there's other notions of information, even inside an area like logic. Uh, and I will get to that question a bit later in my presentation when I think about the information that's produced by logical inference, because that's not purely semantic. That's not just about ranges of options. It also has something to do with manipulating syntax, but I'd better explain that when I get to it. So, in other words, as many significant no information is definitely a significant notion. But if you look at the Handbook of Philosophy of Information, you will actually see that there are a lot of different intuitions about what it could be. And the intuition that I will focus on is the semantic information, the information as range of options. Let me give an extremely simple example of such ranges and how they could also change. Suppose that we're thinking about a party and who is actually coming to the party. And uh, we're just interested in three assertions. John comes to the party, Mary comes to the party, Anne comes to the party. 
that's three propositions. They could be true or false. So in total, for three propositions, each of them true, false, that gives me eight possibilities. So if I don't know anything about that party, then you could say my information is one of those eight possibilities. And one of the eight is uh, the real one. So maybe John comes and Mary come, maybe they all come. That could be uh, the real situation. But now, importantly, I'm learning something. So for instance, suppose that I learn reliably that John comes if Mary or Anne comes. Uh, that's my premise number one. What does that do? Well, that actually changes my current range because I now should keep only those of the eight possibilities that are actually compatible with this information. And I've written this down for you at my second, third line from below. So one reduces this range of eight possibilities to the following five. I could have that Mary and Anne both come and then John comes because that's what one would say in that case. I could have that Mary comes and doesn't come, but that still means Mary or Anne comes. And again, John comes. I could have the symmetric case, Mary doesn't come, but Anne comes, John comes. And information one actually doesn't tell me uh, what's going to be the case um, if Mary and Anne don't come. So that's not M, not A. Then John could be there or not. Uh, premise one doesn't say. So the information gained by the first premise is from eight possibilities to the five, which I've shown here. Your range has become smaller. Let's now get the information from the second premise. N comes if Mary doesn't come. So for that, uh, we look at those five possibilities under one. And <clears throat> again, uh, some are ruled out. Because... Um, if Mary doesn't come and, and comes, well, that's compatible actually with the one in the middle, not Mary, Anne, and John. But it's not compatible with the last two, because in the last two, Mary doesn't come, but the second premise gives us the information that in that case, N comes. So the combination not M, not A is ruled out. So after I've gotten the information from the first two premises. My information range consists of the three things you see in the one but last line. Notice that already from a sort of knowledge point of view, there's something interesting to be observed here, because if you look at those three possibilities, you see that in each of these three possibilities, John comes, right? You see the letter J. So what that means is that on the basis of the information which I have at that one does not stage, I already know that John comes because that's true in all the options in my range. So that's a view of knowledge that you know something if when you look at your range of options, it's true everywhere there. And that's actually the notion of knowledge that you find in epistemic logic. And that I will be discussing much more today. Well, then what does the third premise say? If N comes, John doesn't. Well, um, we can reduce this. So we look at the cases where N comes, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then actually what we see is that MAJ, uh, the first possibility, N comes and John comes. So that's incompatible with the third thing, drops out. The same with not MAJ, the last one, the third one depicted. And the only one which remains is actually uh, Mary comes and doesn't come and John comes. So that's actually the solution to um, this party example. Um, that must be the real situation. Another way of thinking about that uh, is uh, to, to think like this. I told you that um, with that three possibility range, we already know that John comes. Now, the third premise tells us that if N comes, John doesn't. It follows from that in terms of knowledge that um, we already, uh, you know, what we learn from the third premise then is that N doesn't come. Right? If I know that John comes, if I know that if N comes, John doesn't come, it follows that N doesn't come. Okay, so you could think about these in various ways. 
I hope this example will serve to um, give you the idea of range and how range could change under new information. Of course, generally speaking, in epistemic logic at least, the interest is often in scenarios that are a bit more complicated because there are more agents. So a typical uh, scenario in the epistemic literature that I'm working in uh, would involve more agents like a question answer episode. For instance, suppose that we're looking at this picture and uh, you ask me, uh, is this the Tsinghua old gate? Um, <clears throat> so now there's two people involved, you as the questioner and me as the answerer. Actually, as a small aside, the answer is yes, I took this at midnight while actually COVID restricted in a part of the Tsinghua campus. So I couldn't reach the Tsinghua gate or the main part of campus, but I could go there late at night and stay on my side of the barrier and take night pictures. Now, <clears throat> in this case, of course, there's a, you see that different informations might have different information because I know whether this is the Tsinghua gate. And in fact, I know that it is. But you don't when you ask the question. So generally speaking, we also have to look at situations where different agents would have different ranges, ranges or in epistemic terms, where different agents know different things. And then as new information comes in, that can change the information of these different agents in different ways. So for instance, here you could think of the range like this. There's two possibilities. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, the Tsinghua old gate, or it's, that's one or two, it's not the Tsinghua old gate. At the moment, your range, which I've indicated with this line, with the Q, uh, you think that both of them are possible, but you will see that for me as the answer, I don't have a line there. So actually, if it's one, I just think it's one. If it's two, I just think it's two. Well, that models intuitively is that my range is always accurate. I know whether this is stitching my old gate. Okay, so that's a complication. In most of my talk today, I won't talk about multi -age, more agent scenarios, but I just wanted to give you this in the background. Now, in the 1960s, it occurred to logicians that you could actually uh, study this reasoning about information and knowledge uh, using uh, a logical language that would focus on the notion of knowledge and that in the semantics uh, would uh, bring out a notion, the underlying notion of information. So for that language, you could, this is of course what logicians do, they give you formalisms because they actually think that the formulas in those formalisms make certain things more precise, or at least you can read them more precisely. And <clears throat> of course, that means that we're going to deviate a bit from natural language, but okay, that's the logician's style. So in this language, for instance, we could use the operators of propositional logic. Uh, so proposition letters, negation, conjunction, and then we'll have operators k i phi, which we actually read as agent i knows that phi is the case, where phi is some proposition. So that could be, uh, uh, I know that John will come to the party. Or it means uh, it could be something like, uh, I don't know if this is the Tsinghua old gate. And I've written a few formulas, which I'm not going to read, which show you how you could use a language like this to say certain things about questions and answers. But as I said, I won't discuss multi-agent interaction uh, today further. Um, there's also group notions, but I won't discuss them. So for most of our purposes today, just the notation k phi suffices, which is going to be single agent. So that's the language <clears throat> that you can use to write certain laws and patterns. And then how are we going to interpret it? What's the semantics? Well, again, in logic style, you then think of models. Uh, models are sort of structures. You could think of them as sort of mathematical structures, which capture the sort of pictures you would have in mind when thinking about uh, a situation. So epistemic models uh, um, uh, consist of a set of worlds or points. They are the options in your range. The ranges in the multi-agent case are represented by epistemic accessibility relations. I'll, I'll give an example in a moment. And then you also assume that there is a valuation which actually tells you which atomic propositions, basic propositions, are true at each world. 
Now, that's a bit complicated, but um, I'll get to an example in a moment. But again, for today, uh, we can think of this picture as simplifying a lot for a single agent. Just think of the set of worlds, the whole set of worlds, as the semantic range. And let's not worry too much about these accessibility relations for different agents. So knowledge, as I already said, in connection with the party example, I'm going to read as what's true according to my semantic information. So if in my picture to the left, my range is this set of options, say S, T, T prime, T double prime, then knowledge of phi will mean that phi is true everywhere in every of these four possible, in each of these four possibilities. And the truth definition that matches with that is to say that um, agent I will know that phi uh, at a point S in such a model, if for all the points that are in the range of I, as seen from S, phi is the case. Again, in case of single agent, uh, you don't even have to worry about that subscript I. You just, it would just mean true everywhere. But for instance, in my example, I think that's the last time I'll talk about many agents. Uh, my example of the old gate and not old gate, you would actually, it would be a bit different because the knowledge for the questioner refers to everything that's true at both possibilities. So old gate and not old gate. So, for instance, one thing that the questioner would know is that it's a gate, since that's true in both uh, uh, possibilities, but the agent would not know whether it's a Tsinghua old gate. On the other hand, for the answer, where I said that the range was, for instance, at old gate, it was just old gate, it's going to be different because the answer on the same semantics at old gate, the range is just old gate. So that's true there. And the agent knows that the answer knows that it's the old gate. Okay, so I've also said this again at the bottom of this slide um, in the second party state, but let me uh, remind you of that uh, in this state with M, A, J, so, uh, you know, one but last line, M, not A, J, not M, A, J, the range for the agent is these three options. In each of the three options, you see that J is the case, we would read that as saying that the agent knows that J, which means that the agent know that J knows that J is going to come. That's how the semantics works. Now, once you've specified that, then at least logicians think that it's uh, useful to actually now determine the complete set of valid principles. And you can do that precisely because you've given these definitions, right? This now acquires a precise meaning. So we'll, we're going to say that a formula phi is logically valid if it's true in all models at all points, and actually logical consequence can be defined in terms of that. And then here are the laws of this system, which were uh, put forward in the 1960s, although they actually go back to much older systems in modal logic. So let's look at them quickly. The first action called distribution says that if you know that phi implies psi, and you also know that phi, then you know that psi. So what this says is that your knowledge is closed under simple inferences like modus ponens, right? So you, you know the implication phi implies psi, you know phi, the antecedent, then you also know the consequent. Second one, veridicality. What you know is true. And then two uh, actions that have been much discussed that are called introspection principles. Notice that the syntax of this logical language actually allows us to iterate the knowledge operator. So that raises questions. One is a principle called positive introspection. So if you know that phi, then you know that you know that phi. That's valid in this semantics. I'm not going to show that, but it's an easy exercise to see that that must be the case. And in the case of a single agent, it's, it's totally obvious, really, because k phi means that phi is true everywhere in your range. But then that KK just says, go anywhere in your range and see that phi is true everywhere. Well, that just followed. And the fourth principle is called negative. So what this says is that you know what your knowledge is. The fourth principle is called negative introspection, and it says something intuitively maybe stronger. So it says, if you don't know that phi, you know that you don't know that phi. 
So if you don't know that phi, then somewhere in your range, there's a not phi possibility. But you can see that from everywhere in your range. So with maybe that's a very short explanation, you might see that this is valid. So if you don't know that phi, then given the explanations of the models and the language, uh, you will actually know that you don't know that phi. So that means that uh, the agents described here actually are pretty well informed about their own epistemic states. They know what they know, and they know what they don't know. Technically speaking, this is a complete set of actions which can derive all the valid principles um, of the system. Now on this issue of conversation. I think that people often have different reactions to logical systems like this. So some of this see it as a sort of logical fortress where uh, the logicians are hiding with guns and cannons uh, behind the actions. And basically they've drawn up the bridges. So uh, this is just their castle. But you could also think of it differently. Um, the very fact that you're writing up all the valid principles in your proposed analysis of knowledge could also be seen as an invitation to conversation. Because I'm doing you a favor. I'm actually telling you exactly what would be validated by my semantics. And I'm putting this up for scrutiny. So that could be the beginning of a conversation. And in fact, that's what, hap what has happened historically. So these actions have been much discussed. But, well, there's only one that uh, has had very little criticism. That's the second one. Uh, you know, uh, some people even think the second axiom, that knowledge of phi implies phi, is so obvious that you shouldn't even think of it as an axiom, that it's more a sort of presupposition of the verb to know. But never mind. Nobody has problems with the second one. But all the three others have been the subject of philosophical discussion. So it brings me to my third part. Philosophical criticisms of uh, once the epistemic logicians had put forward this system, discussion did start. You might think that uh, this system, by the way, is called S5 uh, for reasons, never mind, um, that it's a sort of unreasonable idealization. And uh, so I'll get into a bit more detail on both of that. Um, so before I go there, uh, let's just stipulate that um, these actions have actually been a matter of philosophical debate. Many philosophers have been unhappy with these actions as a description. And that has something to do with a rich history of new epistemological accounts of knowledge that started appearing in the 1960s in a tradition that's actually continuing until today. So uh, I'm actually, um, I've been involved in this sort of book enterprise with some colleagues, Alexandru Baltak and Sonja Smets, where we're actually trying to look at this whole history of epistemological accounts of knowledge in the last, let's say, five decades, and it's immensely rich. We will own, and part of that is driven with this, by dissatisfaction with the system I just gave you. We will only pick out a few themes. Introspection has been much discussed, but it's not going to be my main topic uh, here, but let me just uh, state it. First, negative introspection seems at odds with simple reality, right? Is it really true that if agents don't know something, they know that they don't know? Well, then Socrates would have had no work to do. But of course, what he had to do was to make ignorant people see that know their ignorance. So it, it can easily happen that people don't know something, but they have a completely wrong conception of what they know. They think they do know. Positive introspection, so the third principle, looks a bit more reasonable. right? So if you know something, you know that you know it. But that, too, has been the subject of various uh, deep philosophical criticisms, for instance, by Tim Williamson, which I won't go into. And... I guess we can post my slides later um, uh, if you want to look at a paper which analyzes uh, Williamson's criticisms, a paper with my colleague Alexandru Baltak. But let's uh, <clears throat> now focus on um, the first of the principles, the distribution.
do we know all known consequences? So that principle, if you have it, would actually imply the following, that we know all the known consequences of what we know. As a special case, what this would mean is that, well, what I say here, that if we know the basic laws of logic, we would automatically know all logical consequences of what we know. Many people have found this extremely implausible. So there's lots of things that I might know, but I just haven't gotten around to actually seeing that it has certain logical consequences, which I would therefore also know. And this is connected with a deep issue, which I actually want to discuss on Monday, not today, about the role of logical inference. Because you could say, one function that logical inference has from knowledge that you currently have is that it can increase knowledge. Of course, you, you have to make an effort because you have to engage in uh, logical reasoning. But then once you do that, you can actually increase knowledge. If you want to do that, the notion of semantic information, which I'm discussing today, is not fine grained enough. So on Monday, I'll talk about more fine grained notions of information that can actually put more of an give more of an explanation how it can be that logical inferences can be informative and increase issues, increase knowledge. So I'll return to this issue in our second conversation. So what have we seen now? The introspection laws have been under debate philosophically, but even the distribution law uh, has been under debate, and in fact, it's, it's widely rejected. Of course, a small reflection, if you are engaged in a conversation or a critical discussion, it's always good to occasionally think, like, what are we talking about? So what is the criticism about? We're looking at the actions. So these are just formal actions, right, in a the system, these four principles. So um, how are we viewing them in the criticism? Do we view them as properties of some abstract notion of knowledge? Or are we actually reading them as describing the behavior of real epistemic agents? And if you think about how I stated the criticisms, you'll actually see that there may be some equivocation between these two senses. It's say that I don't know all the logical consequences of what I know. I seem to be describing myself as an epistemic agent with certain limitations on my abilities. In principle, criticisms could depend on which of the two points of view you take. In fact, there are even people who think that the actions that I've given you are perfectly fine for the abstract notion of knowledge. They're just not fine for describing the behavior of epistemic agents. And in that case, you really have to sort out, like, what are you objecting to and what do you want? Do you want epistemic logic to describe the abstract properties of knowledge? Or do you want it to describe the actual real behavior of epistemic agents? Okay, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, if you pressed me, I would say that uh, epistemic logic tries to describe both, but often isn't very clear on which of the two functions it's describing. But for that matter, neither is epistemology. I've sometimes quizzed epistemologists on what is it that they actually claim to be describing when they write a paper about knowledge? Is it abstract properties of knowledge? Or in their examples, is it about what real language users and human agents would do? And you can get different answers. Anyway, this is an aside. Now, there have, of course, been responses to these criticisms in the logical uh, community as things go in conversation. And um, so here's one which is already implicit in what I said before. Um, we could just think abstractly and say that the modality K models what's called ascribed or implicit knowledge. So it's just knowledge in principle. So for instance, then the idea that it's closed under logical consequence is not so strange because it's just in principle, right? So if I know that P and P implies logically Q, then in principle, I also know that Q. Whether I actually get around as an agent uh, to, to seeing that, that's another matter. Here's another sort of um, a, a response you can find in the literature. It's more the logicians bending along with uh, the, um, <clears throat> the criticisms. So you could say, well, 
suppose that you meet a philosopher as a logician and the philosopher looks at your list of four actions and says i could live with the first three but i definitely rejected the last uh, the fourth one the last one then you could design a new logical system customer tailored which is weaker which keeps the first three principles but drops the last one i'll give an example in a moment my main interest actually in these conversations is the third uh, option that you might call cooperation so um, uh, you listen to the, what the critic has to say uh, you think about new logical frameworks that are inspired by ideas from that um, uh, from that framework but you don't necessarily go all the way to accepting everything that the critic says uh, there's a sort of creative give and take okay I'll illustrate that as I go along this is an intermezzo but just um, maybe uh, quickly even Jaco Hintika, the, actually the, the writer of a seminal book in epistemic logic called Knowledge and Belief, which came out in 1962, um, already rejected negative introspection. Here you actually see a little qualification to my notion of conversation. Um, the conversation can also between you, be between you and yourself. Hintika was both a logician and a philosopher. So the philosopher Hintika could tell the logician Hintika, that uh, certain things didn't look so good. So Hintika rejected negative introspection. He weakened the four actions that we see here to only keep the first three. So distribution, veridicality, and positive introspection. But he wanted to reject the negative introspection. This is a well-known move in the technical logical literature. It means that you're weakening an action system, like which I called S5, the four actions, to one which has one less. Uh, that action system happens to be called S4. Again, for reasons I won't go into. You drop, and what that means is on the syntactic side, you drop the negative introspection action, which you don't like. And in the semantic side, also something changes. Namely, you drop the assumption that your relation is an equivalence relation, so that it's reflexive, symmetric, transitive. And you change to another type of relations, which is only reflexive and transitive. And let me again immediately make that concrete. So now the sort of models we could have, even for a single agent, for this weaker system, could look like the one which you see on my slide. So we see a number of points, and there's an ordering that you can read as going from left to right. That ordering is reflexive, so every point sees itself. Uh, it's transitive. If you look to the future and you make one more step to the future, you, you still look at the future. But typically, this picture is no longer symmetric. So if I go from left to right, that's an option that I see. But it's not given in this picture that um, <clears throat> that same relation will hold from right to left. There's a sort of progression or ordering in the picture. Okay, we'll get back to this in a moment. Now, this is a technical move, and you could learn that in a course on the technical modal logic. But of course, when logicians make a technical move, it invites philosophical certainty. Like, what have we been doing here? It's not just a mathematical move because we've changed to a different way of interpreting the models. And I would say that tree-like S4 models, like the one I had uh, before here, um, your picture would be something like this. What we're looking at is stages in inquiry. From left to right, we go from, if you wish, the present to the future of inquiry. Intuitively, roughly speaking, um, as we go from left to right, we learn more. So knowledge, if knowledge means for everything in your range, it actually means for everything in your epistemic future, in, for everything that holds in all the stages of inquiry that uh, you could still get to. 
So knowledge now has this flavor of always in the future of inquiry. That's very different from, well, it's related, but it's absolutely not the same as my original notion of semantic information. So I would say that if you think more philosophically, a tree like S4 models combine two basic epistemic features. There is still a flavor of semantic information as a range of options, because I'm still interpreting knowledge as what's true in all the worlds that I can reach, going from left to right. But there's another important structure, namely there's temporal steps as I move through this picture in inquiry or action. So this invites, so if we take this seriously, we now have two philosophical topics. One is knowledge as having to do with semantic information, and the other is of knowledge as having to do with temporal inquiry. So a sort of dynamic aspects comes in. And I'm going to continue with that. So it was a sort of intermezzo because, uh, but I think the, the main take home thing from point from this uh, intermezzo is, of course, logicians can make technical moves. But in a conversation with philosophers, you should always think like, what does the technical move mean? Right? What, what, for the original discussion that we're having, and I would say the move from S5 to S4 actually means that we're mixing in a new important notion into what knowledge is about. It's about sem semantic information, and it's about the temporal structure of inquiry. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to, um, okay, as I said, there have been any amount of philosophical theories uh, of, of views of knowledge published in the decades since the 1960s uh, that you could see as, as different sorts of responses maybe to um, the notion of knowledge and epistemic logic. I don't have time to cover all of that. In fact, I just want to discuss one of them, a very simple one, but just to point out the sort of interesting things that you could see if you think of that as what type of response is this? And what type of discussion are we getting into? And my example for that is something that in epistemology is called relevant alternatives theory. And this was proposed by Fred Dretzky. So Dretzky wrote a paper in 69 or 70, um, which um, <clears throat> you could see as a sort of, even though it's not stated as a criticism of epistemic logic, but it's definitely a sort of follow-up discussion. So Dretzky considers the following scenario. Suppose that you're in the New York Zoo and you see an element, uh, an animal with certain stripes. So I think a bit about that animal and then I claim, maybe to somebody who's standing next to me, that what I'm seeing is a zebra. Okay, so animal with white stripes. Okay. So in Dretzky's statement of the scenario, if I've done some work, I'll, we'll get to that in a moment, um, I will perfectly be justified to claim that I can know that the animal which I'm seeing there is a zebra. But now a skeptic comes along and he says, okay, so you claim that it's a zebra, but how do you know that it's not a painted mule? So some animal with some background color on which the stripes have been painted. Okay. And the question is, uh, yeah, how should we think of this scenario? Does this undermine the knowledge claim and so on. The way it discusses this, it also has something to do with the distribution action of epistemic logic, which you saw on my list. Because I know that it's a zebra. This is assumption in the scenario. As I said, we'll talk in a moment about what work that took. But I know that it's a zebra. And of course, I also know that zebras are not painted mules. Okay. But does this really imply that I know that this animal in front of me is not a painted mule? Okay, so that's. So this again has to do with, am I allowed to use distribution in this uh, scenario? Now, this is not the same criticism of distribution as the, what you might call the bounded rationality criticism, which I voiced earlier, that you uh, might not know because it takes too much effort to see every logical consequence of what you know. Because in this case, the logical consequences are relatively clear, right? It, it, it doesn't take much effort uh, to get to this conclusion, K not PM, but the question is, is it appropriate? So as Dretzky puts it, 
uh, this is not a bounded rationality objection because this even arises for what he calls logically astute reasoners. Now, here's Dresky's view of when you are entitled to a knowledge claim. You're looking at the semantic range, so the, the, the various options that you see, and you're entitled to a knowledge claim if you, as Dresky says it, have ruled out all the relevant alternatives. So it could be a zebra, it could be a gazelle, it could be some other wildebeest, maybe some other kind of animal with stripes that you might see in a zoo or a tiger or something like that, right? You rule out gazelle, tiger, and so on. And uh, if what remains is the content of your not claim, just the zebra, then you're entitled to a knowledge claim. So knowledge of phi means you've ruled out all the relevant alternatives to phi. And now this view blocks the inference that I, of distribution that I gave there uh, above, because it all has to do with what are the relevant alternatives. So KZ, the first premise, talks about relative alternatives to this animal being a zebra. But you could say, for instance, that the conclusion K not PM requires ruling out relevant alternatives that have to do with painted mu. And of course, the relevant alternatives for zebra need not be relevant alternatives for painted mu. So basically, on Dretzky's view, a knowledge claim, you can have it if you've ruled out the relevant alternatives, but what's relevant may depend on the content of the knowledge claim that you're making. And since these contact contents can change as you make inferences, certain things could get blocked because the relevant structure has changed. Okay, this is a very short account of the relevant alternatives theory, but it's a very interesting theory, and uh, in one form or another, it's still very much alive. Now let's step back. So this is Dretzky's line. So what is happening here? So now I'm thinking like a logician again. This is not just a simple amendment to epistemic logic semantics, because again, like what I showed you with Hintika, we now are invited to shift to a different conceptual framework for thinking about knowledge, where there's more basic notions instead of one. It's not just about the semantic range of options that I see, but it's also about relevance. So some options might be more relevant than others. That's a new notion. We didn't have that before. So conceptually, we're now talking about two things. Knowledge has to do about semantic range, and it has to do with relevance. And the second thing in the Dretzky account is that uh, there's dynamic actions involved. Epistemic actions are fundamental. Because Dretzky says that you're entitled to the knowledge claim after you've ruled out the relevant alternatives. So what's ruling out? Ruling out is a sort of epistemic action that allows you to discard certain possibilities. You have to do something. And you could even say, although Dretzky doesn't say that in, in exactly the same, with the same emphasis, that what's the skeptic trying to do? Well, what the skeptic is trying to do here is actually change the notion of relevance. Right? So when the claim was just about the zebra, we were talking about relevance having to do with the zebra option. But by starting to talk about the painted mule, we're trying to modify the notion of relevance to take the painted mule on board. So there's also actions of changing relevance. Okay. So even though the Dretzky account may look simple, it actually involves some very interesting moves. Moves that you could think again about remember my conversation, from a logical point of view. Like, how should we think about this? What should we modify, right? Remember I said, um, I'm mostly interested in discussions where you get frameworks that are inspired by ideas from philosophy work together. Okay. Well, <clears throat> one thing is that the relevance, you can think of relevance as a sort of ordering of alternatives. So it refines the epistemic accessibility range. Some worlds are more relevant or more plausible than others. That's definitely something we can study more precisely, even though I'm not going to do that today. 
Well, that definitely corresponds to a whole strand in the current literature on epistemic logic. Semantic ranges are actually ordered by various relations of relevance or plausibility or other things. There's much more structure than just a set of options. And that's in line with, um, well, the Dresky proposal, but also other philosophical proposals for knowledge. So we need a new format now for sort of combined logic for knowledge plus relevance or plausibility. Actually, this happens a lot in current logics of belief, but uh, I was too optimistic when I made my slides. Uh, we'll post some slides about belief, but I don't think I'm going to get there today. But that's one type of reaction. But what I'd rather, yeah, and by with these, but maybe to also make this still a bit more concrete, uh, um, I'll talk about what the ruling out is in a moment. But uh, here's a slide about changing relevance orders. But I think I'm going to leave you to read this if you take some time. Um, this actually gives some concrete examples how uh, the skeptic might actually change a, a current relevance order for the person who made the claim about the zebra to some new one where more ruling out work would have to be done. Okay. So you just read this for yourself. I mean, in fact, many, though not all, uh, current philosophical views of knowledge uh, share one high-level feature. They're not just about static attitudes like knowledge or belief. Equally important are epistemic actions, which create or modify such attitudes. So uh, epistemic actions are things that change your knowledge or affect your beliefs. So following up on ruling out, we now proceed to one uh, case study of this dynamics. And maybe this is already the last and also the most difficult subject I wanted to raise today. And this is a case where um, I'm actually going to be talking about some developments in epistemic logic today, dynamic epistemic logic. Uh, there's an incipient conversation with philosophers about this. Uh, okay, I'll try to explain what that is about, but I'm not going to arrive. I will just want to explain what the issue is. And uh, yeah, then maybe invite you to join the conversation. So, how could we bring these epistemic actions like ruling out into the scope of logical analysis? Well, that actually fits with the sort of interest that logicians have also had in information dynamics. Because what's of course typical for information is it doesn't stay the same, it changes all the time. That was already true in my party example, right? So initially eight possibilities, then you learn more about what the party is like, and every time your range changes, every time what you know about the party changes. Okay. And the question I want to discuss is, what are the logical laws of that, of epistemic actions? And once you have them, what philosophical criticisms or discussion could you have about them? So let's first talk about ruling out. So <clears throat> I'm going to read ruling out very simply as having to do with update with true information. So we have some epistemic model M. Think of that as a range for an agent. Uh, you know, if you want, just think of a single agent. So that circle that you see there is all the options that the agent sees. And let's say that S is the actual world where the agent actually finds himself. And let's say that generally speaking, for any uh, statement phi, uh, there is a set of worlds where phi is the case, and there's a set of worlds where phi is not the case. Now, typically, if you think of a sort of, about the sort of simplest information that you might get, it would be of the form that you learn something true about the actual world, right? Let's say like John comes if Mary or Anne comes. So that's something you're learning about the actual party. Um, <clears throat> what is that going to do? Well, this fits with an intuitive picture that many people have and that you can also find in the, uh, the philosophical literature like Stolnaker's work on inquiry. Basically, what that's going to do is uh, if you get the, if the true information that phi is the case, it rules out all the not phi worlds. So here's Dretzky's ruling out. And in a picture, what that means is that you keep the part of the circle where the phi is true and you ignore or eliminate, delete the part where not phi is true. 
or for the mathematicians, from the model M, I go to the definable submodel M slash phi, which only consists of those points in M where phi was true. Okay, submodel. This is sometimes called hard information. Why hard? Because I take the phi so seriously that I rule out the not phi and just throw them away. This is what you can see, of course, in the second picture. The not phi no longer play any role. You could think of this as about the simplest sort of update, as what you saw in the party example. Okay. Now, to study this, we'd have to do the same as in the epistemic logic uh, uh, tradition that I gave you before. We need a language to talk about this, which highlights some basic features, and we need to give a semantics. Well, what the language is going to do, and here it's going to get harder. So this language is harder to read than the basic principles of epistemic logic. And it's probably for that reason that the conversation between logicians and philosophers has gone so slowly. But in any case, what I'm going to add to the language is the following expression. So you see two brackets. In between the brackets, you see exclamation mark phi and then psi. Now, what does that say? So to do it step by step, phi is a formula or, which stands for some proposition or if you wish some fact. Exclamation mark phi is not a proposition, it's an action or an event. It's actually the action of announcing reliably that phi is the case, right? So phi is a proposition, exclamation mark phi is not a proposition, action or event. The event of getting the information that phi is the case. What do these brackets do around the exclamation mark phi? They say, basically what they say is after. After getting the true information that phi, psi is the case. So this has something to do with the temporal structure that you have in all inquiry. It's not just about what's true now, but it's also about what would be true after you get some new information. So it right now and then after the new information. And formulas like this allow you to talk about that because they say after you get the information that phi is the case, then psi would be the case. So it's not saying that psi is the case now, but it's going to be the case after you get that information. Well, we could also make that more precise in the semantics. I'll leave you to look at that line for a moment. But basically, this says the same uh, thing in the jargon of the models. Okay. So notice that we now read formulas which can basically compare have formulas that can basically compare two things: what's true before getting certain information, and what's true afterwards. This is more complicated than the original epistemic logic because that only talked about the knowledge that you have right now. Right. If I go again back to these axioms, say an axiom like k phi implies k k phi actually says, if you know that phi now, there's no temporal chain, then also now you know that you know. Okay. So, so then we have to think about, okay, presumably what's going to be most important to us now in understanding what's going on here is actually the, uh, what knowledge could you get after information update? Just again, like in my party example at the beginning. So I could write a formula which actually says after update with phi, this is in the middle of this slide, I, the agent knows that sign. So this is a knowledge which the agent gains after uh, having gotten the information that's fine. And in order to reason about that, we'd actually like to analyze this in a certain way. And here is one first attempt at actually analyzing what this says. So you could think of this as follows. What it says is, well, first, phi is true, because we're talking about getting true information. And moreover, what's required for this is a sort of conditional knowledge which you have beforehand. And the conditional knowledge is that if phi is the case, then psi. So conditional on phi, 
you have some. So I call this a first attempt because it's actually not the correct law in general, but look at at least look at what I'm trying to get. So I'm trying to understand when an agent would know that something is the case, psi, after being updated with the fact that phi is true, or after learning that phi is true. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what I'm saying here is, well, one idea I could have about that is that this is going to be successful if phi is true. And moreover, it was already the case that the agent knew conditionally on phi that sign holds. In fact, this law works in a lot of cases. If you were to try it for some examples, uh, it actually works if the sign that you're talking about is what's sometimes called empirical information about ground facts. So ground facts would be things like John comes or this is the Tsinghua gate or something like that. In that case, indeed, the effect of updates can be described by just conditional knowledge. But while this is true, it's not always, it's not exactly what we want, because we're, we're still missing something important also conceptually. Often what we get is not information about ground facts, but epistemic information. So for instance, uh, if you ask me, is this the Tsinghua old gate? I could also say, I don't know. What that would actually tell you is that I don't know whether this is the Tsinghua old gate or I don't know the answer to your question. And that may be very informative. For instance, uh, if you ask me this at the Tsinghua campus and if I don't know, then I must be a stranger because uh, you know everybody on the campus would actually know this iconic uh, object. Or, uh, you know, suppose that the question episode has occurred. So you've asked me, is this the Tsinghua old gate? And uh, I've answered it. I've said yes. Then you could actually say to somebody else that, uh, uh, <clears throat> or, or maybe, sorry, be before the episode started, uh, somebody could actually have come to you. So like, why did you ask me? Well, somebody might have told you, well, A knows if this is the old gate, so you should ask him. Notice that both of these things are epistemic information. It's not about ground facts. I don't know the answer, or somebody knows something that might be of use to you. And now comes my hardest slide, but I, I did want to try to uh, run you through this. Um, <clears throat> if the information that we get can also be epistemic, then actually this simple law, which I just proposed, can fail. So the simple law was that you have the knowledge that psi after learning that phi is the case, even only if already beforehand you had conditional knowledge of phi, psi given phi. So let's think of a very simple situation. Uh, your current range is P and not P. And we're talking about an update with P. Notice that after the update with P, your model has changed. The only option which you now have is P, right? And not P has been ruled out. Okay. So that's just a simple update. Let's now compare the following thing, where actually for psi, we don't take a ground fact, but we take an epistemic assertion. So for psi, we take the statement that you don't know that P, not KP. And let's see what happens. Notice that in this transition, uh, this is an interesting assertion, not KP because not kp is true in the model to the left because there is this not p possibility. But notice also that not kp is false in the model to the right because after the update, you do know that p. So the not kp, which was still true to the left is now false. And that's of course typical for update. When you get new information, what you know and don't know can change. That's the heart of the matter. Okay. So now compare the two sides of this putative action. First, take the conditional knowledge. P, so that's the right hand side. It will become P, and you know conditionally on P that not KP. This is true if you look at a model to the left, because P is the case, say, if you're in the world to the left. And moreover, what you know is that. In every P world that you can see, 
there's still a not p possibility. That's true to the left. But now compare the dynamic assertion. This would actually say that after the update with p, you know that not kp. But this is false, because after the update with p, you're in a model to the right, where there's only the p possibility, and you definitely don't know there that not kp, because not kp is false to the right. Okay, as I promised, this may be the hardest slide I want, or almost hardest slide. It's also the most difficult topic. So for epistemic assertions, this cannot be the right law. It's got to be more subtle. And here is the correct law, at least in the logical system for this. Uh, it says the following. We must, what we must know conditionally is something a bit more subtle. So we'll know that psi after update with phi, even only if phi is the case. And what we know conditionally on phi is the following. Not that psi is true, because we're actually talking about knowledge after the update. What we have to know is that psi is going to be true after the update. And that's what that formula to the right hand side says now. It says that phi is the case. And what you know conditionally on phi is that if you were to give the information that phi, then psi. This is, in fact, the key principle. And it explains many puzzling dynamic phenomena in the literature. Now, <clears throat> I'll discuss it more in a moment, and that's my last topic, as I said, then I'll also stop. Um, with this explanation uh, of update or ruling out, we have a logical system which can describe it. The system can also describe the knowledge effects of getting information. Or, so you can either think of that as getting the information that's phi or ruling out not phi. And there's even a complete action system known. So here's a slide that you don't have to read now, but I'm, I'm just putting it here. So it's a sort of extension of the system S5, which I gave you before. And I've put a whole list of further actions which govern the behavior of these update modalities. No need for us to look at this in more detail. You can look it up or uh, look at the slide later. Well, now I come to my final topic. Suppose that we want to make this a subject of conversation. So the logician is again producing some sort of technical looking principle, the one which I gave you here, and tells us that that's the correct law and tells us that that's really technically needed to get what logicians would like to get, like a completeness theorem. Then there's still the sort of philosophical issue what do these laws, these additional laws mean? So as I said, that's my last topic for today. So how can we judge that? First, this takes more thinking than the much simpler S5 actions. And that's because in this formula, as I said, it's now not just about knowledge, the K operator, but it's also about the effects of learning things where you have these dynamic operators with uh, exclamation mark phi and then the modality for what happens after them. So you could think of this as a difficulty or a problem because now we get logical laws that are very uh, much harder to understand their meaning than uh, for S5. But you could also say that this makes the situation much more interesting because to judge whether you like the action K phi implies K K phi, maybe you only need three seconds. You think about what it says and you say yes or no. Here, you first also have to think about uh, what does this principle actually say? And only after that, do I agree or not? So it's also more interesting. And in fact, this action, like the introspection actions, does make certain assumptions about capabilities of agents engaged in inquiry, because it's now about inquiry. It's also about temporal progression of what you how your knowledge would change as you get certain information. There's actually a nice Stanford PhD thesis by Michael Cohen on this topic, and um, which is called dynamic introspection. I'll just give a light, uh, I'll end with a light discussion about five minutes of uh, what actions like this would say. And uh, you know, uh, if you are interested in reading more about this, uh, this beginning conversation, 
then you could maybe take a look at the dissertation dynamic introspection. But first, maybe a small aside. And this I've already said, but I just want to, just because I've noticed how difficult it is for people to understand the content of these dynamic epistemic actions, uh, to, to also see a bit what the difficulty is. So as five laws like K phi implies KK phi can be expressed in natural language. We can just read these formulas using the verb to know, and then we get a sort of natural language sentence, like if you know something, you know that you know it, which sounds like natural language. So we can appeal to the meanings of the verb to know as we use it. So it's within our general standard thinking. But there is no obvious natural language reading for the dynamic modality after update with phi, or even just the update action, uh, exclamation mark phi, so the event that you get a true information, that's fine. We may have to analyze the formal principle as such. Well, okay, I'm going to phrase one open question there, uh, and then uh, that I'm still thinking about and that you might also want to think about, then I'll go to what the action says. Maybe it would still be possible to find a natural language equivalent to this action which I have here. So we have the static verb to know for K. Maybe we just need to find the right verb for exclamation mark phi or for the modality associated with that. And in fact, one candidate that might come up for that is the verb to learn. So to, to know is a static verb. It describes a state that you're in. To learn is an action verb. It describes a state change from not knowing something to knowing something. Perhaps there is a way of reading this action that I have here, just in terms of know and learn. But frankly speaking, I have not been able to find it. But this may just be a limitation of my own linguistic abilities. Also, well, this is more for those of you who are interested in philosophy of language or semantics of natural language. Is this difficulty because natural language is biased towards static meanings and not dynamics? No, that cannot be it. Because natural language is full of expressions that are about change. So nouns can denote temporal properties like being alive. Many verbs are action verbs describing change. And in fact, there's a sort of pervasive ambiguity throughout natural language where words can even have both action and static uh, meanings, like take a verb like dance. Uh, dance is both a verb, so it's an activity, something that you do. It changes the, the world, your position, where you are, it takes place over time. But of course, dance is also something that you can dance, like a samba or a rumba or a tango or something like that. So it cannot be that natural language itself doesn't like dynamics. But the question is, uh, what's the right way of matching the dynamics in natural language up with the action? Okay. Well, as I said, I promised uh, we start about quarter past one. And I'll definitely finish before uh, uh, 1330. Um, I'll just make an attempt at trying to uh, say what uh, the action says. And uh, I'll leave that as an invitation uh, for uh, you and other philosophers uh, maybe to think about. So think of the action that I gave abstractly as doing the following. It interchanges knowledge and action. On one side of the action actually has knowledge over the action. So it's knowledge conditional on phi about what the action would do, namely that uh, after the action, you'd have psi. And what it concludes from this is the converse. It actually tells you that after the action has taken place, what you would know, right? So you see an inversion, knowing something about the action to after the action, having a certain knowledge. Now, what this says essentially is that a, <clears throat> And I realize this is a bit difficult, that um, if the agent knew beforehand, right, that Psi was going to hold after the update, then that conclusion will follow if the options that the agent sees after the update are actually covered by what was said on the left-hand side, right? So the K says that after the update, I'm going to something in my epistemic range. And in order for me to know psi there, I need to know 
that that is actually one of these cases where the update will produce psi, one of the cases described on the left. Now, uh, I should probably spend a lot more time to explain this, but essentially this says that any option that the agent still sees after the update must have come from an option before the update. In other words, um, there's no new options created by the update. And this is a principle that is actually not so much in the philosophical literature, but in logical agency and also in game theory has been known. And it's called perfect recall. And what it actually means is that when you're engaged in epistemic action, you actually remember the alternatives that you saw in the previous step. Nothing changes there. You remember what those options were. So, and the perfect recall means that you can't get new uncertainties by engaging in this epistemic action. Uh, the perfect recall will tell you what you were uncertain be about before, right? The information update may actually have shrunk that a little bit, but there's no nothing new going on. Perfect recall. I'm not going to discuss the second principle, but also that can be read. I've also tried to put this a bit more abstractly here. Um, so to, to make it even starker. Um, <clears throat> so we're basically looking at two sorts of epistemic principles. One is that after an action, the agent knows that phi. So that's knowledge afterwards, which arises after an action. And the other is in the opposite order, knowledge beforehand, something you know about the result of the action. The action of epistemic logic more of dynamic epistemic logic says that more or less these things are the same thing, right? Because the, it actually expresses an equivalence between these two things, okay? So what you would have to discuss critically is, is this true or reasonable? When is it equivalent to say that knowledge that you will get after an action is the same as what you would know beforehand about the result of the action? Well. Again, I've put a for few formulations here, which I could get to in discussion, but um, I think here is where uh, the philosophical discussion should start. One small thing, uh, this is about the dissertation of Michael Cohen. That dissertation was called dynamic introspection. So I think, yeah, I mentioned it here, dynamic introspection. That is actually because on Michael's analysis, um, uh, <clears throat> A large part is actually concerned with the version of that last implication you see at the bottom, but slightly modified. This is what he calls dynamic introspection, uh, dynamic introspection. If after the action you know that phi, then you know before the action that you would get the knowledge that phi. That's a bit different from what I have here, but similar. Well, I think I'm going to stop here. I uh, should probably have spent still much more time on explaining what the issue is here, but at least I hope to intrigue you. So one way of thinking about this action is just to say, well, come on, it's an action of dynamic epistemic logic. The logicians have found out that it's correct. Uh, uh, you know, so let's just take it. The other way of thinking about it, which I think is actually more interesting, is to think carefully about what the action says, the action says. And then I would say, essentially, what it claims is that the agents have a certain ability to interchange knowledge that they would get before an action with what they know beforehand about the effect of the action. And those abilities have something to do with assumptions about the memory that agents have and other capabilities. And I think there we're at the beginning of a very interesting discussion, like how reasonable is this? So I think um, I'll stop here and say, I've discussed some historical and modern values where logic and epistemology can meet in fruitful ways, assuming some sort of open-minded conversation takes place. Uh, my topics included knowledge and semantic information and putting epistemic actions at center stage. This was only a very small selection of topics and I haven't even gone very deeply into them, but I actually submit that it would be interesting to have many more of these conversations, uh, in particular for today's topic, about uh, if the logicians come up with dynamic epistemic laws of inquiry, what do the philosophers have to say? Could we have a new Dretsky who proposes an alternative which is much richer 
and should the logicians take that seriously again? I'll stop here. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Van Benson. Now, uh, Professor Chen Ruang, give a short comment and question. Okay. Uh, 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 Jiang, please close your uh, PPT. Uh, maybe Chen Ruang will your this. Yeah. Uh, can you see my PPT? I, I don't uh, see your PPT. So it's okay for the PPT? I don't say your PPT. Uh, oh. Uh, Just I, say your face. No uh, PPT. I uh, try to again. Okay. It's okay now? No. Oh. Uh, the the screen said you uh, start sharing your PPT, but I can't I can't say it. Okay, I try it again. It's okay now. No. What's the problem? <laughs> It's okay now? No. Okay. What's your problem? Uh, here, I can see the PPT, but uh, I don't know why you can see the PPT. Guo uh, Xiaodong? 你知道他什么问题吗你能帮一下吗郭晓东郭晓东他什么问题他打开PPT我们看不到那我他就问一下共享一下他的桌面看看韦老师你知道他一下韦老师你可以共享一下您的桌面看看I try again. The screen said you, you had start share your oh, uh, a screen, but uh, don't save your PPT. Mm. Maybe you just say. Uh, it's okay. okay. I just uh, uh, <laughs> I just continue oh. and. Report my PPT. Okay. Uh, first, uh, thanks for uh, Professor Van Van Bens, uh, so one first lecture. I'm not an expert uh, on uh, epistemic logic. And uh, here, Professor Yofano is an expert on this topic. Uh, it's my pleasure to have this chance to know this fasc uh, fascinating subject. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I see, I see. Your PPT, yeah. Now it's okay, right? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay. Good. Okay, first, just some uh, general comment. Uh, I think this is a wonderful le lecture for general audience about the interplay between logic and epistemology. Let's talk, discuss it, some historical and modern values where logic and epistemology can meet in fruitful ways. The speaker presents the materials under big conceptual frameworks with an emphasis. But the, the PPT doesn't move. That <laughs> work normally. That's the move. We only see your first page, the title page. Yeah, title page. Oh, <laughs> but I don't know what's the problem, but I can. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, just talk. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, both the philosophy and the logical readers can learn a lot and benefit from this talk. 
Uh, here is just a brief summary of the talk. Uh, in part A, uh, Professor Van Benson introduced the standard epistemic logic as a theory of semantic information. I talk about the syntax, uh, uh, semantics, and the standard system is fine. In part B, uh, he discusses some philosophical criticisms of the accent of S5 and some response of the criticisms. He talk about the rejection of positive introspection and the negative introspection and the interplay of epistemic logic and the philosophical epistemology. In part, three, uh, in part C, uh, Professor Van Bennett uh, discussed uh, modified epistemic logics. He introduced Henkel's ethical logic and proposed the dynamic perspective of logic. This dy dynamic perspective emphasizes emphasize that knowledge is not just a static attitude and the equally important are uh, epistemic action which create and modify such attitudes. In part D, uh, he discussed information dynamics, finding the logical rules of epistemic actions. He talked about how to update language and the semantics of the logic of information dynamics, how to find the best update law for knowledge. He introduced a dynamic logic of PAL based on its fact. Uh, then he talked about the philosophical analysis of dynamic epistemic laws. He concludes uh, that we can extend the conversation between the original epistemic logic and the epistemology to include the many epistemic actions and the, the dynamic laws that govern the dynamics of inquiry. Uh, finally, it's just some uh, my questions. Uh, here, at least uh, all questions uh, comes to in my mind. Uh, due to the time limit, uh, you don't need to uh, reply to all of you. Maybe you can just uh, pick some. Uh, first question is that what are the essential differences between the logic of a knowledge with a single agent and the logic of and the logic of a knowledge with a group agents? Is the logic of a knowledge with a group agent just a multi-dimensional version of the logic of a lo of the logic of a knowledge with a single agent? A second question, you discuss about the rejection of the distribution rule, the positive introspection, and the negative introspection rule of S5. Uh, this may be okay. <laughs> See, anyway, uh, is there any logic that rejects the variability rule? Uh, three, if we have to complete logic of knowledge or, lo or logic of belief, cognition, or gain, how can we compare the two logics and evaluate which one is better? Four, how the research on philosophy, ep philosophical epistemology can benefit from the study on epistemic logic. What are the differences between the logic philosophical epistemology describes and the logic epistemic logic describes? Or five, how the research on logic of belief and the logic of Knowledge reveals the difference between the notion of logic and the belief. Uh, the last question, are the semantics of the logic of information dynamics just a variant of the well no relational semantics? Is there any new semantic for the logic of information dynamics? Okay, that's all my question. Thank you. Okay, you close your, okay. your PPT. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, thank you for, um, can I, should, can I say something, uh, Chambo? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? I'm asking you as our leader, can uh, I? Now... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You reply. Uh, it's your turn. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, so, Thanks very much uh, for uh, the summary and uh, response. And um, yeah, I think my instructions are also to give short answers, but definitely, uh, you know, many of the points you raise are um, sort of, of course, interesting to 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 talk about more. Um, yeah, one is single agent, more agents, and the differences. So um, <clears throat> in my presentation here, 
I've uh, focused on the single agent, but that's just for simplicity. Um, in the actual work on epistemic logic and applications in uh, computer science or game theory, it's usually multi-agent, right? Because it's all, let's say, games obviously are about more agents and so on. Uh, so you're asking, is there an essential difference? Well, yes. Um, one thing is that the, the computational complexity is higher of the, the logics of more agents. So to take an example, uh, the complexity of single agent S5, that's uh, 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 MP uh, satisfiability is MP complete. So it has the same complexity as propositional logic. But as soon as you take S5 with two agents, the complexity is P space complete. So it has the same complexity as many games. So indeed, the step, the social step from one agent to more is significant in a computational sense, but it's also significant in a, um, yeah, in a conceptual sense. Uh, from the point of view of discussions with philosophy, uh, this is an interesting point because many epistemologists are used to thinking about what single agents know, even though their scenarios are not about single agents. Take the Dretzky scenario. The Dretzky scenario, in Dretzky's paper, he focuses on discussing what I am allowed to claim in the zoo. But basically, the point of the scenario is that I'm meeting someone else, namely the skeptic, right? So it's a two-agent scenario. And um, a, so it's actually interesting. That's an interesting mismatch. And it's sometimes, uh, you know, uh, I'd be interested in discussing a lot more. Uh, it's a point I often wait for as epistemologists. Uh, you're giving single agent analyses, but all your examples are multi agent. So, <laughs> how can that be? Um, <clears throat> then you have a point about. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that was this point. I, my note was this was about if you go to. Uh, logic and, and games, for instance, how could you evaluate the differences between these these various uh, logic systems? So does something happen there? Um, yeah, that's I, I think that's a, a long story to discuss. I, I don't think I'm, I'm going to go into this here. I'll go to your third part, <clears throat> uh, but definitely um, uh, one issue that's going to come up in the game setting is there definitely you have to talk about knowledge, but also a bit about belief. Because obviously, when you think about game solution, it's, you know, we're reasoning about the future of the game. So we cannot even know what's going to happen there. We can only have beliefs about what's going to happen there. So games raise lots of issues about how to combine logics of knowledge and belief. Yeah, then your third point is sort of interesting. Um, if you have such a conversation between philosophers and logicians, um, yeah, what might be the benefits and, and, and yeah, what's happening there? And um, yeah, th this is, I, I think, an interesting point. Um, <clears throat> so generally speaking, if you go back historically in the 1960s or 1970s, um, it was taken for granted that this was a natural combination. And you could go even back earlier in the 19th century because uh, logic was considered a sort of essential tool for philosophers. Right. So if you look at the work of Russell or Wittgenstein and then afterwards Carnap and so on, right, logic for them was a way of developing their philosophy more precisely. And that's still true with some of the great philosophers in the 1960s and later, like uh, Saul Kripke or David Lewis or Bob Stallmaker. Uh, nowadays, this is a bit more complicated because I think the distance has grown between the, 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 the two areas. So, um, but I think what a philosopher would gain is a, the logician can help make certain philosophical uh, conceptions a bit more precise, not because you always have to be precise, that's not my point, but just because that might help in actually analyzing some philosophical conceptions for their content and their consequences. And my example of Dretzky is actually an example. So I think the Dretzky paper is wonderful. It's very creative. It has lots of ideas that the epistemic logicians did not have, and Hintika did not have. On the other hand, the paper is very informal. 
so that to understand exactly what Dretsky's proposal would amount to, it would actually help to also formalize it logically. Um, so I think that would be a benefit. But there is a difficulty. And this, uh, I also discuss this sometimes with colleagues in epistemology. Uh, one difficulty in the contact is also a, a great difference in attitude. So many philosophers I know have the following view that when you think about knowledge, there is one true explanation of what knowledge is, right? So of all the theories about knowledge you could put forward, one is correct and the others are wrong. But most logicians I know don't think that way. They don't think in terms of correctness of the theory, they think in terms of the interest of the theory. You, you see what I'm saying? So in that sense, they think more actually like mathematicians or, or scientists or something like that. So a theory is good if it's interesting. And different theories could be both interesting. So for instance, um, a, at the Stanford Logic, a Philosophy Colloquium, a colleague once made the following observation to me. He said, Johan, your questions are always different from mine because when we have a speaker in the colloquium, the question I ask myself is, do I agree with what the speaker says? Yes or no? And then my question is either I disagree, so I try to give a counterexample that the theory of the speaker is wrong, or I maybe endorse the theory. He says, you never ask whether the theory of the speaker is true, but you ask, is it interesting if I were to think in this way? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, uh, but he said, both kinds of reaction are actually very interesting. And you get the best conversations if you combine those two attitudes. So that's okay. Well, then I'm not going to go through all your things, but um, yeah, believe in knowledge. Uh, of course, I didn't get to believe, but uh, there's a lot more to say about that. And um, yeah, new models for the dynamics. So at the moment, the dynamic, the models I'm using for the dynamics are uh, very classical. And as you may have noticed, uh, give me your background. Um, uh, basically, the model I'm giving for the dynamics has uh, strong analogies with models in computer science, like propositional dynamic logic or, or just logics of state change that you find in the uh, in other traditions. Um, and I'm in a bit in two minds about this. One is that's actually good because it means that um, I can focus on trying to understand the dynamics in terms that we already have. But it's definitely also a very interesting question to ask yourself, uh, could there be a new sort of models for this dynamics, which are not so classical? And notice, of course, in, in line with the attitude which I just gave, I could, wouldn't have a view that one is better than the other. I would actually like to see both. It's just that I don't know how these new models would look like. Very interesting question. So I'll stop here in my responses. Um, maybe you have more to ask or maybe the general public has more to ask. Okay, thank you for your replies. I want to leave uh, the time to our audience for possible questions. Yeah. Can I ask oh. one small question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh, okay. Every colleague in this room can ask a question, okay? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Johan, for the for the wonderful talk. I I want to just ask about this point you made, um, saying knowledge could be interpreted as uh, abstract property of knowledge. Those axioms, uh, or it could be a expression about agent behaviors, uh, because this is a um, two possibility. You might. Uh, uh, also, you may also uh, be able to think from uh, game theory, because in, in epistemology, maybe from the history of epistemology, uh, perhaps knowledge as a notion occurs first, then they might be uh, better considered as uh, descriptions of the properties of a knowledge. Um, but in game theory, uh, it looks like, in general, game theory is about uh, behaviors. Uh, can I also say, uh, in game theory, uh, it probably it's 
easier or better um, to think of those axioms to describe behavior. So this is a contrast mm -hmm. between epistemology and the game theory, yeah. and also think of these two interpretations. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that you raise a number of points, uh, that's, but <clears throat> on, on this agency point, uh, maybe. Um, so first, I agree. So first, very broadly speaking, I would say that uh, the epistemological tradition has looked at uh, abstract properties of knowledge, uh, but if you look at the stories in the background, it tends to be about agents. So that uh, if you look at uh, famous scenarios, I would actually think they're agent scenarios. Like, uh, and, and often uh, they're sort of question answer scenarios with, uh, with different agents. Um, still in the theory, uh, yeah, so that is, so in game theory, I agree with you that um, you think that the agents or the players are much more in focus because, um, right, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's in the nature of the thing. So uh, we have to talk about players playing certain strategies, have a certain maybe belief revision uh, strategies and so on. So there's much more emphasis on agent diversity. And um, yeah, so um, uh, I actually, yeah, I myself am a bit, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say honestly uh, that I still have a sort of difficulty here because uh, it is true, I think, that uh, in these dynamic epistemic logics, also I should apply it to games, uh, agents play in, in a central role. Uh, so that's okay, but it's still not true that those actions claim to describe actual behavior, because then the logical laws would be sort of psychological laws about what, what the, <laughs> the players actually do. So even when you emphasize agents, the laws are still idealized in some way, right? And uh, so how to bridge that gap between, and, and this is sort of dilemma, because if I make the laws very realistic, as I say, then I should be writing papers in cognitive psychology. But then I'm losing some benefit of what logic does, namely that it, it tries to describe uh, the essential information flow and knowledge and belief change in the situation. So there's a sort of tension there, which uh, I'm not quite sure how to um, uh, resolve. The other part of your question I, I could take to be, um, <clears throat> If you make the agents important, then how does that affect the conversation with epistemology? And th this, I think I've, I've said something about a number of times. Um, I find that interesting, but uh, yeah, uh, I've sometimes thought that one thing that one should really do is read a number of classic papers in epistemology and reanalyze them from the point of view of multi-agency. So basically, go to Dretzky, go to other papers, and so on, and ask yourself, right, uh, if you look at what the paper actually says, isn't there also an implicit or hidden account of epistemic agents there, which is just not brought to the foreground? But that, uh, you know, uh, would still have to be done. Of course, there are some parts of epistemology, or like social epistemology, but that's just a small area, right? It's it's not a, 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 a yeah, it's not a sort of dominant area in epistemology. But uh, yeah, uh, in general epistemology, I think the role of agents still needs to be yeah uh, highlighted more. I'm not sure I addressed your question exactly, but at least uh, there was some overlapping keywords. So at least I've done as well as GPT, uh, Chat GPT, I think. In, in, uh, <laughs> Yeah, much better, much, much better than chat GPT. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have more to say, but let me leave the time for others to ask questions. Maybe, yeah, uh, I, I say Ye Ru, Professor Ye Ru is still here. Uh, you do epistemology. Maybe you can ask some question. Ye Ru. Oh, yes. Um... Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, please, yes. Thank uh, you. Uh, 
Yeah, very inspiring. So uh, I'm not a, I'm also not an expert on dynamic epistemic logic. Uh, so, uh, but I have a question um, about uh, what you said um, earlier about uh, restricting. So, um, uh, so that, about the semantics of uh, dynamic epistemic logic. Um, is it the same thing as um, um, the semantics? Uh, some some philosophers semantics for uh, conditionals um, and not for material conditional, but for uh, indicative conditionals. So um, according to some theory, um, the condition a, a material conditional is true if the consequent is true if we restrict to those situations in which the the antecedent is true so i'm just I have a i'm this is a very general uh question yeah. about the, the relationship between um the the, the logic of indic indicative conditional and your dynamic epistemic yeah. logic yeah no very that's a very good question um, i can say something about that so thanks um <clears throat> so in the way I've given the semantics, you don't see such an analogy because the update, right? Basically, what it does is it takes this current model. You get the information that phi is the case, so you leave the phi part. You throw away the not phi part. It's it's hard to relate that to the semantic conditions, but I'm totally with you that actually there should be a connection, and one reason for the connection is already in the natural language reading of these dynamic uh, operators. Because the dynamic operator says, after the getting the information that phi, psi is the case. So that feels a bit like a conditional, right? The antecedent is assume that phi is the case, right? <laughs> That's that first part. And the psi is the consequent. It says what, what will be the case then. So there is sort of, yeah, dynamic, there is a sort of flavor if you think of natural language as a, uh, you know to read it conditionally you could even read it as a counterfactual conditional namely suppose that i were to get the information that phi but maybe i never will <laughs> right so okay counterfactually then psi would be the case that, that all that uh, strengthens your analogy so can we do that well then we have to think of uh, just as you said we'd have to think about the update semantics which i described as a sort of instance of this conditional Lewis Stolmaker or whatever semantics, we'd have to think of some sort of notion of closeness of, of models. And one intuition might be that if I update with phi, I go, go to some closest model to the current one where phi is known. You see what I mean? So I, I take this idea of a closeness ordering, which you also find in. So then you'd have to explain in what sense my dynamic update is associated with the closeness order. And this is very interesting. Uh, actually, I've long thought that there should be technical results there, <laughs> but I've never been able to formulate it in a way in which I find that completely satisfactory. So in other words, this will be a good example again of a logic uh, philosophy conversation. If a philosopher asks me, isn't there also some flavor of conditionals in, in your dynamic system? I say yes, but let's try to figure out exactly how. Cool, okay. thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, Shuzachi is still here. You do some research out about Drisky. You know a lot about Drisky's paper. Maybe you can uh, ask some questions. Last uh, question. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Johan. Open your, your camera. I'll try. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you very much for your nice talk. I just have one quick comment about the philosophy and the one question about the logic part. Uh, about the uh, history uh, of philosophy, uh, you mentioned that philosophers only concerned with a single agent maybe that's because philosophers in the history are more concerned with the notions of 
loan is rather than what different agents know. So the single agent can actually be understood as any arbitrary agent. I think maybe this is the reason. And the, about my question, my question is about the logic of dynamic knowledge, the especially about the reduction axiom of dynamic knowledge. From the reduction axiom of dynamic knowledge, it seems that the dynamic operators exam and psi combines both an action of information receiving and an action of logic inference. I'm wondering if it is possible to disentangle these two kinds of action, since in this case, original article, he wants to reject kind of closure. So, so that, that's my question, is possible to just in time, there's two kinds of actions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But could you, I just had some difficulty with the sound quality of the connection. Uh, could you say again, could you please state your last question again? I, th I think I understood. Uh, what you sure. The last question about how to say the reduction axiom of dynamic knowledge. I think the dynamic operators maybe it combines just two kinds of actions. One kind of action is I receive the information side, and the other is I use that information to do one step of load P inference. Right. So okay. Okay. maybe I'm okay. to disintegrate these two kinds of yeah. actions. Yeah. Yeah. So um <clears throat> okay. Um First, your first point, that's of course, yeah, that was just about, uh, you know, maybe there's a reason why philosophers uh, don't emphasize this multi agent perspective. Let's take that uh, aside, but definitely, I didn't want to make very strong sweeping statements uh, about what all philosophers do or not, right? Uh, uh, in fact, you should see my presentation as a relatively relaxed mode because I actually find that I can talk to epistemologists and we don't quarrel. So it seems to me that there's enough congeniality <laughs> to, uh, uh, to have conversations. Yeah, about your, I think your second point is, if you think about these updates, don't they combine different things? Like maybe getting semantic, new semantic information and some sort of deduction that we could actually maybe perform from the content of the update. And uh, yeah, I think that's true in real scenarios. Um, I'll actually try to say a bit about this on Monday, because there I also want to talk about the way in which inference would actually it could change knowledge. Uh, so that uh, so disentangle that from uh, uh, what I presented here. Um, uh, so that is one part of the answer. The other part is that it's definitely also true that if you think about what I call the simplest update with hard information, so you know you get exclamation mark phi, you keep the phi worlds, you throw away the not phi worlds, that it's possible to think of that not as one single operation, but as a complex operation which does several things at the same time. And in other work, uh, which I've done on, on what's called evidence models uh, for um, uh, knowledge and belief, uh, you can see how that works. Because you could think, if you have exclamation mark phi, then there's actually two things that happen. One is that you get strong evidence in favor of phi. But the other thing is that you're ruling out not phi worlds. So that's another thing. You're doing something good for the phi worlds, namely adding evidence that they are the right uh, area. And you're doing something bad for the not phi worlds, namely pushing them out of the range of consideration. It is possible to think of such things as separate actions. So I also have some work. You try to uh, decompose 
the system I gave so far. But that's a decomposition in terms of evidence, not in terms of inference. So I've given you two answers. Look at my inference logics on Monday, and maybe I could give a reference to my work on evidence logics, where also, um, yeah, what's now treated as a single update action would actually become composite. Okay, thank I you. Okay. That's just part of your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think the time is up. Maybe we should stop here. <laughs> uh, thanks to Professor Van Benson uh, uh, for your really clear and informative lectures. Thanks, uh, Chen Rong, Liu Feng Rong, Ye Ru, Shi Zhao Qin, the comments and questions. Uh, let's let us expect expect the Monday's lecture by Professor Van Benson. Okay. Uh, bye bye.